In 1893, something happened in Roanoke, Virginia that was unlike any other event in American history. The year before, a man named William Lavender was accused of a crime and murdered by a mob. The city, controlled by the railroad, made a serious attempt to prosecute these crimes, but they were unsuccessful. The next year, a man named Thomas Smith was accused of a crime, and when a mob of 5,000 people tried to break him out of the jail, the state militia fired on the crowd, killing eight and wounding 34, including the mayor. The mayor and other public officials were forced to flee the city. Neither Thomas Smith or William Lavender have a historical marker with their name on it, or even a gravestone. Since they have nothing else, I dedicate this story to their memory. I'm Johnny Ashley in the Hood in the Woods, your neighborhood backwoods history and travel channel. You can find me on Facebook at The Real Hood in the Woods and on Instagram as Abandoned in Appalachia. If you'd like to help me out and help yourself out too, you should get the official copy of The Hood in the Woods book, Volume 1 and Volume 2. The link will be in the description. Another thing in the description will be a link to my other YouTube channel, The Family Court Guide. Welcome to Roanoke, Virginia. So many people have been killed in American history through acts of extrajudicial mob justice that it has its own name, lynching. Colonel Judge Lynch is an unmentioned character in this story because his name is attached to these actions. To understand what happened in Roanoke, we need to understand Lynch's law and its legal and illegal applications. Lynch's Law The first written account of extrajudicial mob justice was in Persia 2,500 years ago. The first known case in America happened in 1630 with the death of Jeff Billingston. He had been on the original crossing of the Mayflower. Ten years later, though, he was accused of murder and hung by a mob of angry pilgrims. In 1767, Charles Lynch became a justice of the peace for the British court system in Bedford County, Virginia. He came from a wealthy landowning family. Lynchburg, Virginia, that's named after his brother, John Lynch. Charles had gotten into politics before the Revolution, and during the war, he became a colonel in the Central Virginia Militia. In 1780, there was an uprising of British Loyalists. They were called Tories. On August 1st of that year, Virginia Governor Thomas Jefferson sent Colonel Lynch a letter. He told him to round up the ringleaders, try them for treason, and send the guilty parties back to Richmond. Colonel Lynch was kind of acting like the grand jury, where he would figure out who would need to go to trial, and then they would be sent to Richmond where there was a functioning court system. Colonel Lynch set up an informal court at his plantation in Alta Vista, and he sat as the judge. This isn't actually the house, his house burned down, and then the second house burned down. So this is the third house that was built on the site. It's a 1903 Queen Anne Victorian. Instead of sending the Tories back to Richmond, Colonel Lynch decided to sentence them. No one was sentenced to death. Most people were forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance, pay fines, or lose property. But the worst offenders were tied to a black walnut tree that used to stand right here and given 39 lashes. As a member of the state legislature, two years later, after the revolution was done, he got them to pass an act absolving him of any guilt for administering frontier justice in the absence of a court system. Charles Lynch died in 1796 at the age of 60. As America's frontier pushed west, Lynch's law became a common law. Another common law frequently used with Lynch's law was posse comitatus, which is Latin for power of the county. It meant that a group of common people could be mobilized by an officer of the peace to suppress lawlessness or defend the county while receiving standard law enforcement immunity. These are good examples of Lynch's Law and Posse Comitatus, a.k.a. Frontier Justice. People believe that two brothers, Little and Big Harper, were America's first serial killers. In 1799, a group of settlers in western Kentucky formed a posse to track down the brothers after they had killed and robbed some of their neighbors. In a shootout, the posse wounded one of the brothers. Then they beheaded him. They put his head in a tree at a crossroads as a warning. The area has since been called Harper's Head. In 1859, a few years before the Civil War and 15 years before becoming a state, Colorado's first execution was performed. A man had been accused of killing his brother, but the nearest court was 600 miles away in Leavenworth, Kansas. So he was tried by a people's court. 48 hours after being found guilty, he was hung. Western states and territories made hanging the penalty for cattle rustling and horse theft. Any cowboy movie you've seen where they string up the cattle wrestler or the horse thief, that's Lynch's Law and Posse Comitatus in action. When Toby Keith and Willie Nelson sing the song, Beer For My Horses, and they say, take all the rope in Texas and find a tall oak tree, copyright, collect all them bad boys and hang them high in the street, copyright, for all the people to see, copyright, what do you think they're talking about? On the other hand, in 1889, Jim and Ella Watson were hung in Wyoming for cattle rustling. 
being established members of the community, this caused an outrage, as six members of the posse were arrested, charged, and tried for their murders. But they were acquitted after several witnesses died or disappeared before the trial. I'm going to use Colorado as an example to compare with Virginia, because it's just so different. There wasn't much of a black population in Colorado, but a few years before it had been part of Mexico, and it had a really high Mexican population. Between 1959 and 1919, 175 people were lynched in Colorado. That's a rate of 3.5 a year. 80% of the lynchings in Colorado were done by white settlers to white settlers, and Mexicans only made up 10%. Virginia had fewer lynchings than any other southern state. Between 1880 and 1926, 91 people were lynched in Virginia at a rate of 1.9 a year. Now, Virginia had a functioning court system during all this time, so their history with lynching is very different. In biblical times, the Romans would execute people by crucifying them, leaving them suspended high in the air to serve as a warning. In medieval times, Flavian Impala would execute people by impaling them on spikes and leaving them suspended high in the air to serve as a warning to his enemies. In the pre-Civil War South, enslaved people that killed their masters to try to escape would be hung, leaving them suspended high in the air to serve as a warning to other enslaved people. Before the Civil War, most lynchings were done by white settlers to white settlers. But after the Civil War, the racial demographics began to quickly change. Virginia's numbers begin 15 years after the Civil War, and 83% of the people lynched in Virginia were black. The Virginia numbers beginning in 1880 coincide with a populist movement that the court system was not effectively protecting the citizens. By default, not having faith in the court system cannot be considered frontier justice where you don't have a court system. By the 1890s, the era of the Roanoke Riot, mobs of people breaking into jails to kill people were growing more common. Also, from being almost exclusively whites before the Civil War, by this time black people made up the majority of people being killed. In March 1891, the largest lynching in American history happened in New Orleans. Encouraged by the local paper, a mob of 5,000 people broke into the jail and killed 11 people. They were all Italian immigrants charged in conspiracy for the assassination of a police officer. Three had been tried and acquitted, five hadn't had trial yet, and three had had a mistrial. Roanoke, Virginia, the magic city of the New South. In 1852, the Tennessee and Virginia Railroad reached a small village named Big Lick. It sat on the banks of the Roanoke River. Since no one could take that name seriously, in 1874, the town decided to change its name to Roanoke. The word Roanoke is derived from the Algonquin word for money. If you float down the Roanoke River, you'll come to the Atlantic Ocean in North Carolina, right where the lost colony of Roanoke was. In 1884, Norfolk and Western completed the New River Line. That line was meant to bring coal out of West Virginia. The town quickly became a major railroad hub, as well as becoming a local commercial center. Virginia is a southern state. Before the Civil War, coastal Virginia was controlled by large landowning families and had a lot in common with the large plantation owners of the Deep South. West Virginians had so little in common with the coastal Virginians that they left the state during the Civil War. Southwest Virginia is, give or take, a few counties from North Carolina and a few counties from West Virginia. There were plantations here, but not large ones that like the coast and much of the industry was based on logging and mining. Locally, there's many rocky mountainous areas that aren't suitable for farming. Many of the small local substance farmers were drawn to Roanoke for the industry. Many others ended up there because they sold their land to the railroad or coal companies. Many of the railroad executives and investors came from northern cities. Most of the city's black population wasn't local and had been migrating north since the end of the Civil War. The Northern Base Railroad had little tolerance for the South's racial issues. They made Virginia's first interracial cemetery, when a mine explosion killed 114 men, but they would only grant one plot of land for a cemetery. The railroad was about money, not morals, and that same cemetery had people buried in it that they killed during the Cold Wars. Roanoke was the railroad's town. The wealthy business owners and railroad executives lived in southwest Roanoke, in between the train tracks and the Roanoke River. Roanoke's black population lived north of the train tracks, in the Gainesboro neighborhood. 
The southeast neighborhood is south of the train tracks and east of the Roanoke River where it turns north. Working class whites lived in this neighborhood. They were a lot more local than the managerial class that lived in Southwest that they worked for. A similar quality house, same size and lot space cost twice as much in Southwest than it did in Southeast. By the 1890s, Southwest Virginia had become the most lynching prone part of the state. Most of these killings were in mining areas where the white local population was coming into contact with black people who had been attracted to the area for employment. In 1891, two years before the riot, in nearby Clifton Forge, four black miners dressed up as cowboys and went to have a night on the town. The police thought they were having too much fun, but when they tried to arrest them, the four miners embarrassed them. Then the miners headed home. The police called up a posse and they went after the miners. In the following shootout, one of the posse members was killed. After the miners were arrested, a mob broke into the jail and took him out. They let one go, a 17-year-old. The mob then hung the other three. Also that year, in neighboring Montgomery County, an Italian immigrant named Della Bari was accused of violating the two-year-old daughter of another Italian immigrant. He had to be hidden in Roanoke for his own protection after a mob of Italian immigrants tried to break him out of the jail. In 1892, one year before the Roanoke Riot, William Lavender was murdered. The Assault of Alice Perry and the Murder of William Lavender This is the Jefferson Street Bridge. In between the Jefferson Street Bridge and the Franklin Street Bridge, long before this park was built. In 1892, this was the Adam Brothers and Payne Brickyards. Elizabeth Perry was a widowed English woman who had immigrated to America with her 15-year-old son and her 12-year-old daughter named Alice. Miss Perry ran a boarding house for the brickyard and it sat near the Franklin Street Bridge. Jay Adams, Miss Perry's brother-in-law, he also lived there with his wife. The boarding house was reserved for white boarders and around it was a collection of shanty houses to be used by the black laborers of the brick factory. But right now, they were empty because it was off season. On a February afternoon in 1892, Miss Perry sent her daughter Alice into Roanoke to hire a woman. Her neighbor, Jenny Kritzer, went with her. Miss Perry told the girls to be back before dark and across the Roanoke River at the Jefferson Street Bridge, not the Franklin Street Bridge because they might get muddy. As they crossed the Jefferson Street Bridge, they saw a black man in a gray suit and rubber boots walking down the train tracks. A witness who was fishing down at the river said he saw the same man enter one of the unoccupied shanty houses. As the air cooled and the shadows grew long, the two girls hurried across the bridge to get home. After crossing the bridge, they walked down a path at the bank of the river towards their house through the abandoned shanty houses. They noticed, walking very slowly ahead of them, the same man in the gray suit that they had seen earlier. As they passed him, he asked the girls if they knew if Mr. Smith lived around there. Alice responded that she didn't know anyone by that name, when suddenly the man grabbed her. They were only a few yards from Alice's house, and she screamed to Jenny to run and get her uncle. Alice decided to go out kicking and screaming. The man threw her on the ground and stuffed her clothes in her mouth to silence her. Jenny ran right past Alice's house to her house, and she told her dad what happened. He sounded the alarm and got Alice's uncle. The man in the gray suit saw the lights and heard the door slam, so he released Alice and he took off into the night. Jenny's dad and Alice's uncle, they armed themselves, and they recruited two more men to help them search the shanty houses and down by the riverbanks. By nine that night, they crossed the bridge into Roanoke, where they began looking for him there. They also reported it to the police. By 11, they were crossing the bridge back home. The Jefferson Street Bridge is east of the Franklin Street Bridge. To the west of the Franklin Street Bridge is the Main Street Bridge. A man who traveled across that bridge at 9.30 then traveled down Campbell Street. In between 8th and 9th Street, he encountered a man that fit the description of the suspect. The witness knew nothing about the assault, and when he neared the man, the man asked him what he wanted with him. What? What are you talking about, said the witness. I don't want nothing with you. Leave me alone. William Lavender was buried in the Roanoke Almshouse Cemetery. In 1959, that cemetery was moved here to the Coiner Spring Cemetery. William Lavender is buried in an unmarked grave behind me. A few days later, around noon, a black man named William Lavender walked into the Roanoke Gas and Water Company looking for work. An employee who had read about Alice's assault in the news noticed Lavender's gray suit and rubber boots. He sent him out back to chop wood, and then he sent word to Alice's uncle saying that the man he was looking for was there. Adam and Kritzer armed themselves. Then they went to detain Lavender. When Lavender saw them, he fled, and he had to get chased down. Lavender told him that his name was Al Winston, and he had never been in Roanoke before. They took him to the brickyard, where Alice ID'd him. 
Then, as I began marching him back to Roanoke to the police station, a crowd began to form. As I walked down Campbell Avenue, a man standing on the front porch of the Ponce de Leon Hotel recognized Lavender. His name was Mac Morse, and he was a former chief of police. Lavender was known as a petty thief. He had been sentenced to the city's chain gang a dozen times for a total of 20 months. Morse had even supervised one of the chain gangs that Lavender had been on. Several months earlier, Lavender had hit Morse in the head with a stone, a crime that he had served six months for. Now this is the Roanoke Courthouse, but this one was built in 1915, so it's definitely not the one that we're talking about. But it still had to be right in the same area because a lot of the other landmarks are right here too. After arriving at the police station, Lavender was put in a cell. Meanwhile, the mob flooded into the courtroom and was making threats about hanging Lavender. After hearing about what was happening, Mayor Evans went to the police station. There, a warrant was written and served to Lavender. Rumors were, to protect Lavender from the mob, they were going to put him on the 6 o'clock train to Lynchburg. So part of the mob came to Schaefer's Crossing with plans of stopping the train and pulling Lavender off. By 8 o'clock, the chief of police decided that he needed to hide Lavender for his own safety. Out of sight of the mob, he had Lavender climb out a window and down a rope to the hands of a couple cops waiting for him on the ground. They ran through alleys and shadows, avoiding lights and people until they reached the home of Officer Tally. There in the kitchen, Lavender was interrogated until he confessed to knocking Alice down. Just hanging Meanwhile, the mob waiting at Schaefer's Crossing realized the train wasn't coming, so they went back to the police station. Mayor Evans addressed the crowd. He said, go home and let the law run its course. The crowd responded that all they wanted to know was if Lavender was still in the police station. When the mayor refused to let anyone in to see if Lavender was still there, the mob decided to split up and do a grid search of the city. They searched the homes of police officers until midnight, and that's when they reached the home of Officer Tally. When he refused to let the mob search for Lavender, they knew they had found him. Within 15 minutes, 100 people circled the house. Two against 100 ain't a fair fight, especially when the two have guns and they don't use them. Soon the mob was breaking down the door and beating the cops black and blue. They identified Lavender as the man they wanted and he was dragged off into the night. The mob brought Lavender to the Roanoke River near the Main Street Bridge. A noose was tied into an inch thick rope and it was tossed over a branch. The mob demanded a confession of Lavender who sat on his knees in a thin layer of snow. Lavender denied being the man. To quote the 1892 Roanoke Times article, he was given a taste of the tightened rope to quicken his memory. Now he admitted being the man, but he denied the charges. The rope was tightened again. This time he was lifted three feet into the air and dropped. When asked again, he admitted knocking down Alice while he was drunk at the river. That was enough for the mob, and at 1.30, he was picked up for the last time. It was a cold morning, and the residents of Roanoke were headed to work when the frozen body of Lavender was found hanging six feet in the air. He was found by seven, and by eight, a crowd began to form. Some gazed in horror, and some in awe. At 10.30, his body was cut down, not by the police or his friends or family, but by souvenir seekers. Lavender was due one final disrespect as his body, now frozen solid, was dropped six feet to the ground, and pieces of the rope and his clothing were cut off for keepsakes. As morbid as this keepsake thing sounds, it was actually really common back then, and even when Bonnie and Clyde got killed with their shootout by the police, their bodies were almost picked bare by people keeping souvenirs too. The coroner was summoned, and he summoned a grand jury. They viewed Lavender where he lay on the riverbank. So much of his clothing had been removed that he lay there nearly bare-chested. After they viewed Lavender, he was sent to a funeral home. Ultimately, he was buried in the Orms House Cemetery. Officer Tally, the cop that had hit Lavender from the mob, then been beaten black and blue by the mob without firing the shot, said that he couldn't identify anyone in the mob because he was all wearing bandanas. The jury ruled that Lavender died of strangulation, homicide. Judge Robinson was furious. He advised the Commonwealth attorney to investigate, and a few days later, he ordered a grand jury. After the grand jury heard a bunch of witnesses say stuff like I don't recall, they couldn't find one person to charge with Lavender's murder. Maybe another reason they couldn't come up with any charges was because the local paper, the Roanoke Times, decided to publish the names of both the coroner's jury and the grand jury. They named them in an article titled Viewed by a Thousand People, a reference to what happened to Lavender the day after he died. Another article written the day before was called Judge Lynch, Roanoke's First Execution. In that article, things that happened at 2 a.m. made the morning paper. It doesn't say who wrote it, but the reporter says he caught the police sneaking Lavender out of the police station and tagged along with them to the cop's house. 
He stayed there for a while before taking off, after he heard the confession. Nowhere in the article does he say so-and-so told me anything. It's written like he was there. He knows where Lavender is, and then seems to pick the right group because he knew the cops didn't shoot and were beaten black and blue. He wrote that Lavender cowered in a corner. How would you know that if no one told you? Then down at the river when they, quote, gave him a taste of the Titan rope, how would you know that if you weren't there? If the same reporter wrote both the stories, it would seem that not only is he involved in the death of William Lavender, but he also published the names of the people investigating it, in two stories that cheerleaded on the events. Since Officer Talley testified that he couldn't identify anyone because they was all wearing bandanas over their faces, does that mean that the Roanoke Times reporter was also wearing a mask? Everything I've written about William Lavender is based off of those two newspaper stories, so anything that you feel like you should take with a grain of salt, you probably should. Norfolk and Western was also furious that this could happen in their magic city of the New South. Southern racism was not going to stand in the way of this northern company's profits. Soon, big changes were underway in Roanoke. Mayor Evans appointed John Terry as a new police chief. Then Mayor Trout was elected mayor. He was a prominent banker and a former Southern officer that had survived Pickett's charge during the Battle of Gettysburg. Mayor Trout vowed that never again would a prisoner be taken by a mob in Roanoke. Henry Trout's dad, John Trout, he had been the first mayor of the town, back when it was still called Big Lick. This isn't the old Presbyterian church. This one was opened in 1929 on the south side of the Roanoke River, south of Southwest. Many black Roanokers were also members of the First Presbyterian, and they held services in the church's basement. First Presbyterian had originally been in Gainsborough, but they had recently moved to a new location on the corner of Roanoke Street and Church Avenue. Problem is, I can't find where Roanoke Street was, so we're just gonna check out the churches on Church Avenue. In the 1890s, nationwide, there was a growing temperance movement, which means to ban alcohol. Roanoke was no different, and one of the major players was William Campbell, minister of the First Presbyterian Church. He said that Roanoke, in his morals for a time, had sadly deteriorated, and he blamed the deterioration on the baneful influence of bar rooms and the arrival of dangerous people inclined to do as they will in a new place. Ironically, Reverend Campbell was from Berkeley County, West Virginia, and had only been in Roanoke a few years himself. In an April 1901 Roanoke Times issue, they listed the court proceedings, which included business licenses. Ten alcohol-related licenses were granted, compared to the four ordinary and retail licenses that were granted. Encouraged by people like Reverend Campbell, there were multiple raids on saloons near Railroad Street. A few years before, there had been a smallpox outbreak in Gainsborough, and the rhetoric from that epidemic was continued by the Roanoke Times. They accompanied the police on one of these raids, and they wrote of bars so unspeakably filthy and pestilent where one could see the grim form of disease rising from the place, with his skeleton-like fingers spreading the black mantle of death and disease all over the city. On September 5, 1893, the dries beat the wets in a very close vote. There was 1,824 votes for prohibition and 1,625 votes against it. The local whites loved their alcohol, and they blamed this prohibition on the black residents teaming up with the business class whites from up north. Also during this time was a recession caused by the Panic of 1893. Now this recession, it affected all working class people equally. 1893 would become the bloodiest year for mob violence, leading to the deaths of 100 black people. In Southwest Virginia, the year was off to a bad start. In February, five black men had been hung by a mob in Tazewell County. In April, another man was hung in Tazewell, and in May, a man was hung in Smith. Five days before the Roanoke riot, in nearby Dansville, the militia was called out to protect the jail, while a mob tried to break in and hang a man. No shots were fired, and the mob went home. Sally Bishop's assault, Thomas Smith's murder, and the riot. On September 20th, 1893, 15 days after the prohibition vote, Sally Bishop came to the Roanoke City Market to sell produce from her farm. 
She was an aged and respected wife of a former in neighboring Botetourt County. A black stranger approached Sally. He told her that Miss Hicks, who lived a few blocks away, had sent him down here to buy a box of grapes, but Sally would need to deliver them to get the payment. He led Sally to a house on Salem Avenue and into the basement of what turned out to be a vacant house. That address is now where the Ort Museum is, which is this funky looking thing. The man locked the door behind him and demanded Sally's money. She handed over her wallet and pleaded for her life. Reaching into his pocket, the man produced a razor and he tried to cut Sally's throat. She fought back, but the man hit her with a brick repeatedly and left her for dead in a pool of her own blood. Sally came to a half hour later and crawled to the city market looking for help. She was so battered that when her son was called to identify her, he said that it wasn't her. Sally told the men at the marketplace that her attacker was a black man in his early 20s. He was wearing gray pants, a black frock coat, and most importantly, a black slouch hat. Word quickly spread. The small police department was informed, and the farmers at the market began looking for a suspect. Far ahead of the crowd galloped William Baldwin. He was the head of the Norfolk and Western's private police, and the bad guy in a lot of my Cold War stories. Near the edge of town, on Buena Vista Boulevard, Baldwin found Thomas Smith, a black man with a big floppy hat. Mr. Smith denied involvement, but after Baldwin produced a pistol, Mr. Smith climbed onto Baldwin's horse so that Miss Bishop could identify him. As they headed back to town, they encountered other searchers who began to follow them. Sally, who had had her eye knocked out of the socket during the attack, said she couldn't ID him, and she asked to see his hat. After looking at the hat, she said, this is the man who attacked me. Baldwin put Smith on the horse again, and they headed to the jail. By this time, the crowd had grown into a mob, and they demanded that Smith be turned over to them. The 1890s was early in Baldwin's career. Thirty years later, though, he would drop bombs out of planes on the miners during the Battle of Blair Mountain. He must have had a reputation back then, too, because after he pulled his guns on the mob, they calmed down. Baldwin explained how sketchy the identification was, and the mob might have calmed down, but they didn't disperse, and they followed him to the jail. Several hundred people surrounded the jail and demanded that Smith be turned over to him. The mayor, prosecutor, and judge took turns trying to calm the crowd, promising a speedy trial. Besides 10 or 20 people, the whole crowd left, but the ones that stayed, they had no intentions of leaving, and soon another crowd was forming. The crowd grew, and a rumor spread that Mrs. Bishop's son had gone to Botetourt and got men to help him break into the jail to help him avenge his mother. As the sun set, 50 to 100 men being led by Miss Bishop's son arrived on horseback. The men from Botetourt rode up to the jail and demanded that Smith be turned over to them. As the mob grew to 5,000 people, city officials had a meeting. The chief of police said that they should move Smith to Radford to hide him, and the mayor agreed. Judge Turner opposed the idea. He said that the city should be able to protect its prisoners. The mayor nodded his head. The general instructions are to resist the mob with firearms if nothing else can be done. At 4 p.m., the mayor called up the state militia. The Roanoke Light Infantry Blues was a mix between Boy Scouts and a social club. Most of its members weren't even old enough to shave. The militia took up positions around the jail with the bayonets attached. Two people that didn't get back quick enough were promptly arrested. The mayor called out members of the crowd by name, warning them that he was prepared to use force to protect Smith. The mayor addressed the crowd, but they weren't listening. Bricks and rocks began to get thrown at him and the militia. Then people began to break down the western door. Across the street, several people began firing pistols, and the mayor was hit in the foot. Then he told the militia to fire. The militia fired two volleys into the dense crowd. The crowd fled. As the street cleared, the dead and wounded were all that were left. Some accounts say that over 150 shots were fired. Worshippers at Green's Methodist Church took cover as bullets ripped through the building. Outside, the jail was riddled with bullet holes and broken windows, and the streetcar tracks were full of blood. Eight people were dead and 34 were injured. The mayor was one of them, and he was taken to the Ponce de Leon Hotel. The mob was furious, and soon they were inside the hotel searching for the mayor. He was able to escape them by hiding in the servants' quarters. The mob then went to his house looking for him, and he was hurried out of town into hiding. While the mob was in the hotel, the police chief went in there. He said he would give them Smith if they would just stop. The mob searched the jail looking for Smith, but he wasn't there. It turned out during the confusion of the shooting, a sergeant had snuck him out the back door. The militia left too. 
They was only here to protect Smith, and now that he wasn't in the jail anymore, their job was done. Plus, they were now getting run out of town by the mob. The mayor couldn't give any orders because he had to go into hiding too. After the unsuccessful search of the jail, the mob began searching government buildings and homes of public officials. If the mob couldn't have Smith, they wanted the mayor. All this while makeshift hospitals were being set up up and down Campbell Street to attend to the dead and wounded. The chief contacted the sergeant and convinced him to return Smith to the jail. Then he tipped off the mob. An ambush was planned on the corner of 2nd and Franklin. At 2 a.m., as Smith and the sergeant returned to the jail, Smith saw the men trying to ambush him, and he fled. Smith only made it a few blocks before he was caught, near the corner of Franklin and Mountain. A rope was tossed into a hickory tree. Lord have mercy on me, Smith yelled as the noose was placed around his neck. He was pulled into the air. As Smith struggled, the mob used his body for target practice, filling him with bullet holes. Before the sun rose, the coroner summoned a grand jury and the Roanoke Times published their names. A sign was pinned to Smith's chest reading Mayor Trout's friend. That's the sight the citizens of Roanoke woke up to the next morning, and soon a crowd began to form. Souvenir seekers had already began picking at Smith's clothes before the coroner showed up with the grand jury. By the time the coroner was done, the crowd was up to 4,000 people, and they were still furious at the mayor over the shooting the night before. When the coroner was done, he demanded that the mob allow Smith's body to be turned over to the undertaker, but the mob refused. Instead, the mob decided that they wanted to bury him in the mayor's front yard, and he was cut down and dragged through the street. The mob also threatened to burn the city down if they weren't given their way. Reverend Campbell, a First Presbyterian, the leader of the anti-liquor movement, who the night before had sat counseling dead and dying people in the makeshift field hospital, stepped from the crowd and grabbed the rope that was being used to pull Smith. He demanded that the mob stop. They refused, and the Reverend begged and pleaded for an end of the violence. Robert Mormon, the president of the Roanoke Electric, Water, and Land Company, and also the clerk in session at First Presbyterian, stepped forward with another idea. The mob liked his idea, so instead of burying Smith in the mayor's front yard, they decided to take his body down to the river and burn it. The Roanoke Star is on Mill Mountain. Part of Mill Mountain is called Walnut Ridge. On Walnut Ridge, there was a narrow gauge railroad that came down the mountain and crossed the Roanoke River. I'm not sure exactly where this bridge was, but we're gonna be down at the river and we're gonna pass it whether we know or not. Smith was put on a wagon and Robert Mormon led a mob of 5,000 people down to the river where they chanted, burn him, burn him. The mob collected wood and tore apart fences until they reached the narrow gauge railroad bridge going across the Roanoke River. They piled the wood up at the riverbank and placed Smith on top of the pile. Then it was all doused with coal oil. At 10 a.m. a match was struck and 4,000 people watched Thomas Smith burn. His sister, age 15, was one of them. As the fire burned down, the crowd dispersed and they headed back to Roanoke where they continued their threats against the mayor, the militia, and the police. The mayor had gone to Lynchburg to hide the day before. And in his absence, his position was filled by R. Buckner, the president of the city council. Meetings were called for railroad and machine shop employees and also by social clubs like the Masonic Lodge to help ease tensions in the city. Still a group of determined men stayed by the courthouse. They said they wouldn't disperse until the mayor and several other police and public officials were removed from office. If that didn't happen, there was going to be more trouble. After talking it over, the city suspended everyone that the mob wanted gone, but they didn't have the power to suspend the mayor. As a trade-off, the city gave the mob a list of Mayor Trout's close personal friends so they could give their word that he would not act as mayor until the investigation was complete. And after that, order was restored. Mayor Trout returned to Roanoke a week after the riot. When he returned, he was greeted by an enthusiastic crowd of 300 people. On October 23rd, the grand jury indicted 19 people. The police chief and the sergeant that Smith had been with were indicted as accessories after the fact. 17 of the people were indicted for breaking into a hardware store and looting guns during the riot. On November 15th, five people were put on trial for burning Smith's body and four of them were convicted and sentenced to a year in jail. The other people, convicted for breaking into the hardware store, they were given shorter jail sentences and small fines. The grand jury commended the mayor on his attempts to protect Smith. So did many members of the state government and local business leaders. Witnesses refused to testify against the police chief and the sergeant, and soon the charges were dropped. The mayor still demoted the sergeant and fired the police chief. For the black members of First Presbyterian, the relationship between them and the church was destroyed. 
In 1898, that portion of the congregation raised enough money to establish their own church, the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. A few months after the riot, Charles O'Farrell became Virginia's 42nd governor. The Roanoke riot was a shock to the state, and he ran as a law and order candidate. Of lynchings, he said, quote, I condemn and denounce lynching in any state of the Union, wherever there are adequate laws for the punishment of crimes, and judges and jurors who will enforce them, there can be no justification. The mob undertake to mete out punishment to offenders by becoming offenders themselves. They show their detestation of crime by committing crimes themselves. The remedy? Hold law officers to the strict accountability and sustain them whenever necessary with soldiers who will do their duty fearlessly. If any of the mob are hurt, it will be because they were trying to break down law and order and defy legal authority. If innocent men are injured, it will be because they were out of place. No law-abiding citizen should allow his curiosity to draw him to the scene. In addition, punish the lynchers, and in order to do so, provide for a change of venue. Then, let the press of the country exert itself, making lynching so odious that no community will attempt it. On multiple occasions during his time as governor, he sent the military to suppress lynchings and also introduced two anti-lynching laws, neither of which got the support needed to pass. He didn't stand for the common man, though. He stood for the railroad and what was good for their business. In May 1895, 15,000 coal miners were given a 20% pay cut and went on strike. They were in a West Virginia county that bordered Virginia and had shut down all the mines in their county. Their plan was to cross into Tazewell County, Virginia, and shut down mines there too. In response to this, Governor O'Farrell sent an artillery company and six infantry companies to the state border to keep the mines open. The year after the riot, on May 26, a man named Fred Hairstrom was arrested for violating an eight-year-old girl on 16 different occasions and threatening to kill her family if they informed on him. For his own safety, the city of Roanoke decided to move him to Lynchburg. 23 years after the riot, in 1916, a small article appeared in the NCAA magazine. It said, quote, the jailer of the Roanoke, Virginia, has recently revealed the fact that Smith, who was lynched on September 21st, 1893, for assaulting a woman was innocent and known to be so by officials a short time afterward. The real criminal was arrested, but after a conference, he was allowed to leave on the train as long as he promised never to come back. That's my video, hope you like it. If you did like it, you need to hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. Don't be watching my stuff for free. Here is some more videos you might like.